Yeah. Romans chapter 11 and uh, verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. That's what I want to talk about is goodness and severity. One of the most common questions that sinners and atheists and agnostics will ask is, how can you believe in a good, perfect, loving God? How could there be such a world as we see around us with all the cruelty and injustice, suffering and pain, if there is a good, perfect, loving God? Holy God. Well, this verse gives you the answer. Yes, I believe in the goodness, but I also believe in the severity of God. And that's why we live in the kind of world we live in, because God is both good and severe. Uh, He has an element of mercy, but He also has an element of judgment. This world and every one of us is under judgment. Now we're also under mercy and we're also under goodness, but don't don't ever forget. We're in a sin cursed world. First place you'll see in scripture the goodness and severity of God is when he came down and dealt with Adam and Eve and their sin. The goodness was even though they had done What he said, well, you'll see the goodness at the first day of creation, everything, you know, he saw what he had made, it was good. Second day, so on, he completed the creation. Uh, After day six, he said, behold, it was very good. So you see the goodness of God there. And he gives man, he sets man in the garden, and he said, uh, of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat. That's the goodness of God. But, here's the severity of God. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's in the midst of the garden, you shall not have eat of it. And the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Severity of God. And uh, man disobeyed God, Eve, and then Adam. And God cast man out of paradise. That's why we're not living in paradise. That's why we're living in the kind of world we're in. The severity of God. You know, if a church, any movement, denomination, uh, or any nation that loses track of these two essential points, foundational, pivotal, cardinal points here, the goodness and severity of God, they're going to get way out of balance in all of their teaching. Our justice system is out of balance They've lost track. Because you see, not only is God good and severe, every authority, every person who's in authority, they need to have those aspects of goodness and severity. Every husband, every father and mother in dealing with her children, she needs to have these aspects. Some people have even said that, uh, you know, God put Fathers, he made fathers and mothers. Because usually, and there's exception to this, usually the father is more on the severity side with the children. The mother's more on the goodness and mercy. One man said uh, God made fathers to teach their children justice. And he made mothers to teach them about mercy. And uh, some there are exceptions to that. But as a general rule, that's true. I've seen many a case. You know, you you don't have to learn everything by experience. You can learn some things by observation. You can even learn things by reading the Bible that people with all kinds of experience don't know. And I've seen many a time when when a father was wanting to come down with severity on the children and his wife, their mother, would step in and, and interfere. Be careful when you do that. Because those children, they need to know about goodness, but they also need to know about severity. It goes back to Adam and Eve, as I said, there, there was, but yet even in that punishment, you know, there was a promise, uh, given, said, uh, to the woman, even though you did this, 
uh, I'm going to bruise through your seed. I'm going to bruise the head of Satan. So the promise of the Messiah was given. There again you see the justice and judgment, but even uh, even mercy as one of the prophets. Was it Habakkuk? who said uh, after God showed him the judgment that was coming on Israel, you know, he starts out crying out, God, how long until you bring judgment and justice? And then when God got through showing him what he was going to do, Habakkuk, his cry, his cry has changed. He said, oh, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Yes. And uh, he will. He'll remember mercy even in wrath. But uh, some people, this verse is telling us, some people, all they get is the wrath. And then other people, they get the mercy. Same thing with uh, one of the next stories that we see. Right. In, well, the, the, the story of Cain is another one. But the flood. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's the goodness and mercy of God. But God brought the flood in on the world of the ungodly and destroyed them all the world that then was perished being overflowed with water. There's the severity again of God. But in the midst of all that severity, there's mercy. See, Mo- Noah didn't survive. Uh, Noah had sins that had to be forgiven too. Noah, why did he survive? Not because of his goodness, but he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, that helped him to be a better man. The mercy and grace of God. He accepted the mercy and grace and the gifts of God. And he escaped the wrath. He found grace. And grace is unmerited favor. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, as I mentioned, Cain. Next story after Adam and Eve. Uh, we see God. You know, what if Cain would have got what he deserved? God would have... Well, he'd have never even let him do what he did. He just killed him while he was in the act of trying to kill his brother. Or he could have killed him immediately after he did it. That would have been judgment without any mercy. Right. And uh, God's judgment was mixed with him. So he sold Cain. He let him live. He let him live. But he said, uh, I'm going to put a mark on you. And you say, well, Cain, did Cain get off easy? Well, he didn't think so. No. He said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. This is too severe. And he said, God, whoever finds me, they're going to slay me. And so God even had some mercy for Cain. He said, well, I'll avenge you, Cain. Anybody who does that, he made, uh, I think God let everybody know. Uh, I've judged Cain. I've put a mark on him. Now you leave him alone. Or I'll, uh, I'll avenge Cain. I'll avenge Cain, even the murderer, the first murderer. God had some goodness and mercy for him. Uh, look over in the New Testament. Some people say, well, those are Old Testament, and the Old Testament's full of the goodness and severity of God. What about the Deuteronomy 28? The blessing of the law. He said, if you will keep the law, all these blessings shall come upon thee and they'll overtake thee. If you don't, you break the law, I'll curse you and all these curses shall come upon you. And he gives a whole list of blessings and an even longer list of curses because he's trying to scare them straight. You know, he realizes we need that factor of fear and intimidation. Uh, Where I work years ago, there was too much of this. I think we, they, they got out of balance. Management did on the side of goodness and mercy. And it was found by Verities, who were uh, uh, George Verity was the son of a Methodist minister up there in Middletown. And they were devout people. They took before there before it was even required, you know, to take care of workers that were injured, those type of things, workers comp. They just did it. They took care of a man got killed. They took care of his widow. They didn't have to by law back then or by union, by contract. But they just did a lot of those things because they were good men. And uh, maybe after them, they got uh, the men following them. They got to where there was too much goodness and mercy. And people were getting by with murder, so to speak. I mean, there were people... There are stories told, and I believe them. I've seen some. There are people, they go to work on a 3 to 11 turn. 
they would work, some of them would work an hour or two. They'd give their badge, their punch-in badge to one of their buddies and they'd all leave. And uh, they'd be out partying or playing or whatever and their buddy would wait till 11 o'clock and punch them all out. There were fellows who never even showed up to work. When they were, when they knew there would be no salary bosses out there, I'm sure there were some salary bosses who, who even helped cover. They never even showed up to work. They just gave their badge to somebody. They punched them in and punched them out. I've heard of guys, uh, you know, being on vacation all week like down in Kentucky, far away, and get paid as if they worked because they had a buddy who punched them in and punched them out. Well, you get too much of that going on, and you know what happens? Your company's going bankrupt. And everybody was in danger of losing their job because they were saying, I remember a few years ago, they, the the rumor was going around, they don't have enough money to make payroll this month. And no bank wants to lend them any more money because they've been so soft and man in the nature that he is, a whole bunch of them will take advantage of that. It was a freeloader's paradise. I've often said that's what America has been lately a freeloader's paradise sure they'll take advantage of the goodness and people take advantage every day of the goodness of god but we saw it there well now we've the pendulum so what did they do they said the board of directors sat down and said we can't continue this way uh and you know what they did they went looking for the hardest meanest most severe Man that they could find. One named Tom Graham who had cut some 50,000 jobs uh, when he worked for another steel company. And uh, the unions absolutely hated his guts probably more than any other man uh, in America. Well, they brought him in as a supervisor. And man, he started firing people right and left. You talk about they abused the goodness And here come the severity. And I mean, sometimes I think it is too severe. You know, man makes a mistake that costs them money. You're fired. And their attitude is, well, the union might be able to appeal this and get you your job back in a year or two. Maybe, maybe not. We'll risk that. But as for our point, we're just coming down. And you know what? The message got out real quick. They mean business. Uh, anybody who's, who has an accident, you will meet, you don't have to go out and be tested for alcohol or drugs in your system. If we find any in, in there, you're fired. Period. No mercy, seemingly, you know. And, uh, guess what? We are now the most profitable steel company, uh, in the country, if not the, not the world. Severity, fear, and intimidation. You can say what you want to about it. In this world, as men are with their evil natures, it works. It scares everybody straight. And they say, I better not go to work. Oh, they, they tell the time years ago, it was nothing to find whiskey, hard liquor, beer out there where men are drinking on the job. They'd sneak off and drink whiskey and, and all kinds of that sort of stuff. And I've even seen them smoke Marijuana years ago, uh, right there while they were on the clock, supposed to be working. Uh, now, I haven't seen that lately. I haven't seen it for many uh, years, as a matter of fact. You see, this aspect of severity, it works in, in all areas, but uh, in, in all areas of authority. But there also needs to be goodness and severity. You see, uh, Apostle Paul said, talked about Caesar bearing the sword. He said, if you're doing what's right, you don't have to be afraid of Caesar. But he said, if you're doing wrong, you better be afraid because he bears the sword. And he doesn't bear the sword in vain. He is a terror to evil workers. But his job also, he said, is to reward them that do well and to punish evildoers. So uh, God has set up every authority. And if you're going to be an authority, you need to understand... These principles, every one of you, fathers, mothers, you're in authority over your children. You need to be both good and severe. You know, it's good for kids sometimes if you just uh, 
whip them without warning. You know, when they're doing something you've already warned them about in the past. You know, sometimes parents are so good they gotta beg and nag. Don't you ever get sick of watching parents nag their children to try to get them to do what's right? Every now and then it's good to just surprise them with a little severity. It'll make them think twice uh, in the future about their foolishness. God is both good and severe. And any church who forgets that, any nation who forgets those two aspects, is going to get out of balance. And they're going to end up with a whole lot more trouble than what they realize. You know, when this nation was more severe, there was a lot less crime and a lot less suffering, therefore, in the nation. Uh, when the fellow, I mentioned this before, the fellow was going to get caned for Singapore. You remember that incident? And we thought, oh, that's too severe. All American people were crying out, that's too severe of a punishment. What was it? Six lashes he was going to get? And some of the leaders in Singapore said, don't try to teach us about justice. Said, look at Los Angeles. They had over a thousand. They're a comparable population city. So they had over a thousand murders. And I think Singapore last year. And they said, we only had, I think it's 34. Very, just a few. And some of you say, well, it's a cultural difference. But no, Singapore used to have a terrible amount of crime. But they decided they were going to crack down on it. They decided it was going to get severe. And uh, they cleaned it up. They, both of these aspects. If, and, if, and the reason why I'm emphasizing the severity, I think in this day and time, that's what needs to be emphasized. We've gone, uh, you know, we're about to sink, capsize the boat because we've all ran over to the goodness side in this country. Uh, even the fellow that was executed a few uh, a week or two ago, uh, he had been 20 years since he committed the crime. You know, uh, so we've erred too far on this side of goodness. Well, the scripture, as I said, is full of this. I don't see how that the Calvinist can read this chapter and maintain some of the beliefs that they do. Let's go back and uh, uh, read some of Romans chapter 11. I say, then hath God cast away his people. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Want ye not what the Scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars. And I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace and is no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works and is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? You see, folks, Israel backslid. And in verse 14, he's saying, I'm just trying to save some of them. Was Israel, was the majority of the Israelites lost? 
Paul thought so. He said, I'm trying to save some of them. And he said, there is a, a remnant according to the election of grace. I'm trying to provoke them to emulation that I might save some of them. Were they cast away? He said they were. The casting away of them is the reconciling of the world. For if the first fruit, verse 16, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert graft in among them, with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I was reading that book Finney talked about revival. He said one of the things that will kill a revival is people get to bragging too much about the revival. Now, it's, there's a right way to do it, but brag on the Lord. Be careful not to say, well, our church is doing this and we and I'm doing this. He said bragging too much on the revival will kill the revival because pride will enter in. Here he's saying to the Gentiles, don't brag about your superiority, supposed superiority to the Jews. Thou wilt say then, verse 19, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest He also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. You see, those doctrines, I want to tell you these doctrines of eternal, unconditional, eternal security, perseverance of the saints, uh, that's an overemphasis on the goodness of God. Sure, God wants you to persevere. God wants everybody to go to heaven. It's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But uh, let's don't leave out the severity of God. All the dire warnings that are given to Christians in Scripture, that are given to churches in Scripture. What about the book of Revelation, the seven churches? He said, uh, I gave this woman space to repent of her fornication. You know, there she was in the church committing fornication. She knew better than that. But God yet said, I didn't immediately bring judgment. I gave her space to repent. I said when she wouldn't repent, He said, I'll cast her into a bed. And uh, those that commit fornication with her, I'm going to cast them into the great tribulation. Uh, Jesus, here's the goodness of God. He said, Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets, killest them that are sent unto thee. Even though you did all that, Jesus said, how oft would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? And ye would not. Now here comes the severity. Henceforth, your house is left unto you desolate. Because you didn't know the time of your peace. You didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't have enough, the right spirit enough to recognize when your true Messiah came to you. And so, therefore, he pronounced judgment. He said, look at, they said, look at this temple and these buildings. He said, there's not going to be one stone left on another. And that happened just 30 some years after Jesus made that statement. And uh, he was crucified. 70 AD. That's when they sacked and destroyed Jerusalem. Their house was left unto them ju- uh, desolate. The severity of God fell. Behold, therefore, and you can read just about any chapter in the Bible, and you'll be beholding both the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in His goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. I was talking about warnings to Christians. That's pretty plain, isn't it? That you can backslide, you can be cut off unless you continue in His goodness. Unless you keep on believing. You know, He that believeth, that means he that keeps on believing is going to be saved. 
uh, its goodness toward if you continue in its goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. You can be. The natural branches were cut off. What makes you think one that's grafted in can't be cut off? It most certainly can. And they also, he said, if they abide not still in unbelief, it's possible for a backslider to come back. Verse 23, there are those who teach well, if you do backslide, you never can get back again. Look at verse 23. And also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Same branch that He cut off and cast away, He's able to pick it up and graft it back in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. He's talking about the future there. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now, you may think, well, the Jews aren't enemies anymore, but let me tell you, the Jews have had a lot to do with getting the Bible and Christianity out of our public schools and university. They don't want Christ to be mentioned in our school, and they say, we don't believe in Christ, and we don't want anybody praying in public to Christ. They are still enemies uh, as touching as concerning the gospel. They are enemies, most Jews, there's some, there's still a remnant that has accepted Christ, but he said they are enemies as concerning the gospel, but, but as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sake. So you see, you gotta have the proper understanding of you. They're in, a, they're enemies of the gospel, but still, we ought to love them, and we ought to bless Israel because of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. For the Father's sakes and all the prophets, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have also, have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy Upon all, oh, the depth of the riches, both both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Well, let's remember in all of our ways both the goodness and severity of God. And yes, sometimes a Bible preacher has to be severe. A godly person who's godlike, they have to be both good and severe. You read some of the great men uh, of faith, and they could talk to people so severely, pronounce judgment on people uh, when they needed it. But that's one aspect of God and of God. And if we become like God, we're going to be both better and more severe all at the same time. Amen. 